So in this lecture we're going to talk about the strain life approach to fatigue. And basically instead of stress as the controlling parameter as we've seen in the stress life approach, strain will be the controlling parameter that we'll use for the strain life approach. So from that point of view it, it seems kind of simplistic, but why might we want to use strain life instead of stress life? There are some major features and advantages to this approach. We can incorporate loading path dependence. Because we're going to be looking at finite fatigue life, maybe one to less than a million cycles, we're going to be accounting for the plastic strains that develop in the material. The plastic strains that develop in the material are loading path dependent. So if you have a, a high tensile overload followed by some cycles or a high compressive underload, if you will, followed by some cycles, even though the stress range may be the same for both of those instances, the strain range and the mean strains and the mean stresses that develop in those two cases will be different. So we can account for the path dependence of plasticity. We can look at very easily at arbitrary loading paths. Or variable amplitude loading. We can do that with a stress life approach too. But understanding what goes on in the stress strain response, as we've seen already in class, allows us to identify hysteresis loops and cycles, or what we'll start to shift to now in this section, reversals of load that will be damaging uh, events. Typically, we see that there's less variation in test data. due to the testing methods, the load levels, and the more modern testing machine control uh, controls that we have, we tend to see a little bit less variation in the test data. We'll be able also, also able to account for transient material behavior if we want to. And some may say it has a more useful design region. If you're in the finite life, you know, say 10 to a million cycles. Why might you want to do finite life? Well, take for example a fuel tank on a rocket. So something that NASA would build, it may only have uh, one use. It may go up and it may be recovered and, and melted back down or, or recycled, but it may only have one use for that. So um, now I'm not saying there's only one cycle, maybe there's one overall use cycle, but there might be lots of vibrations and things going on, but it has a finite life. It's not intended to be designed for an infinite life like we've seen in some of our stress uh, base fatigue approaches where we have an endurance limit and effectively infinite fatigue behavior based on some materials. Right, so we saw the justification for using the stress life approach rotating bending that occurs in train axles but what's the justification for using the strain life approach? All right, so when we were uh, when we were to look at stress concentrations, um, say like uh, notches, and really, it's pretty much impossible to avoid 
creating an engineering structure without some sort of stress concentration. It could be a rivet hole in an aircraft skin. The rivet pops out and you got this hole sitting there. It could be a notch, it could be a thread of a bolt, anything like that. It's really hard to avoid stress concentrations. And when you look at stress concentrations, these are the places that are most likely to have yielded material. So that yielded material might create this plastic zone. And it's surrounded by elastic material outside of it. This elastic material pretty much constrains what goes on inside this plastic zone. And so that's where the strain control comes in. So if you can imagine having some kind of a large notch, if we were to take a tensile specimen then this central portion of the tensile specimen would effectively be a strain controlled behavior. So what we can say is, is that uh, stress concentrations and I'll put in parentheses with plasticity tend to be strain controlled. And so this will be our justification for this. Now fortunately modern testing machines we can take a specimen that looks like the one that I've drawn can be an hourglass or dog bone. And we can put an extensometer on it. Maybe I can stretch this out and make it look a little nicer. I don't know if I succeeded or not. But we can take our specimen and we can put a strain gauge or a, an extensometer on this. And the electronics are sophisticated enough now that the signal can be monitored for its change in length. And based on the original length, we can calculate the strain. And the testing machine can adaptively keep the same strain level for each time that we cycle it. So you know, if this is strain versus time, we can we can keep this plus or minus strain value for each different cycle. Now because of that the stress values may change, so the load on the specimen may change over time with cycles, but we do keep that particular strain value constant. Again that's been an advent since the Oh, maybe the late 1950s, uh, but particularly in the 1960s, you can start to get commercial testing machines that were servo hydraulic that use these feedback loops on these different signals. So we can talk about something called the strain life curve. And in a way, it's similar to the stress life curve, but there are some important differences to it. Now, historically, the way that the strain life curve can be thought of is, is it goes back to our ideas of decomposing the total strain into elastic and plastic strains. The stress life approach is, is very good when we have primarily elastic strain behavior. All right, so if we, re, re, if we remember There's a certain portion of the stress life curve where we have the stress versus the number of cycles of failure, where we have kind of a straight line on our log log plot. And we can develop an equation for this region. This is called the Baskin equation. 
where the stresses fit to the uh, number of cycles, and so it's a log equation. And we've seen log equations before. We talked about this in our previous chapter on stress life. If we wanted to recast this in strain, we could do so through the use of the modulus of elasticity. And in fact, instead of using the nominal stress S, we're going to switch over to the, the real or true stress sigma. So we'll take the stress amplitude, and to emphasize the cyclic nature of this, we'll say the stress range divided by 2. Okay, so S would be our nominal stress. And here, sigma would be our um, true stress. And we would have the data, and there's going to be an important difference that we'll talk about in more detail later. But we're going to plot the number of reversals, the log of the number of reversals down on this axis. Now, what's a reversal? OK, well, we talked about a cycle. And we talked about the hysteresis response for a cycle. You know, I guess if we started here and we ended back up at the same spot, we can go from here to here as a cycle. It's easier for me to draw when I start at zero. Well, one cycle has two reversals. And what's a reversal on the hysteresis plot? So this is stress versus time. On the hysteresis plot, a reversal is one branch of a hysteresis loop. OK, so we'll emphasize this again in a minute. Um, but one cycle is equivalent to two reversals. All right, so when we were looking at this data, we kind of said, well, okay, let's have this to be 10 to the 3. If we wanted to, we could kind of extend this down to 10 to the 0. Now, the, the, the best nice looking slope is really on the high end of this, on the high cycle side. So if we fit this to a straight line, we might find that our data tends to fall pretty good over here and the data may be off over here so doesn't fit this in very well but it does really good on the high cycle range and that's kind of be to be expected based on what we know about our SN curve the SN curve fits this finite life region on the high cycle side better than 10 to the 3 or less cycles to failure So what would this equation look like? Well, it's a log equation. So we would fit the delta sigma over 2 value to a power law relationship. It would have some kind of coefficient. We're going to call that sigma f prime. And then it has the number of reversals to some exponent. So it would be 2 in f. In you can think of 2 and f is 2 times the number of cycles, or you can think of that as a symbol that represents reversals. And b represents the slope of this. It's going to be a negative slope. It's going to go downward. And the sigma f prime is the, the spot where if we were to extrapolate this fit line down to one cycle, it would be the intersection of this point. The sigma f prime is the uh, fatigue strength coefficient. Uh, 
and the B is the fatigue strength exponent. So the strengths are related to stresses, and so the stress amplitude over 2 can be cast in reversals in, in this way. And this is known as the Baskin equation. All right, a, uh, a little bit later, people were more interested in low cycle fatigue. And so Coffin and Manson, uh, they were working at General Electric, I think looking at um, turbine engines, collected a lot of fatigue life data, and their plastic strains were so great they just said, uh, let's not worry about the elastic strain at all. And so they looked at the log of the plastic strain amplitude versus the log of the number of reversals to failure. And so they were in the kind of low cycle range. So here's 10 to the 3, uh, excuse me, 10 to the 0. And what they saw is they had a very good uh, correlation on the low cycle side. Uh, but over on the high cycle range, it wasn't uh, fitting really well. But, you know, if you focus more on the low cycle side of things, less than, I don't know, 50,000 cycles or so, then this fit is pretty good over here. And so with a straight line, you, you have the, the same power law fit again. So now you have the plastic strain amplitude is equal to some coefficient. We call that epsilon f prime times the number of reversals to another uh, different exponent. And by the same reasoning, if we were to extrapolate this out to one cycle, this intercepts over here at a epsilon f prime corresponding to one reversal. Epsilon f prime is known as the uh, fatigue ductility coefficient. And the C is the fatigue ductility exponent. All right, so the, you know there's a very strong correlation here. We think of strength and stresses uh, more on the high cycle side, low stresses, and higher stresses, high plastic strains. We think of things of being controlled more by ductility. So we have the fatigue ductility coefficient and the fatigue ductility exponent. Now each of these like I said, had certain places where they weren't as good as others. <clears throat> um, but if we think about our decomposition of our strains to elastic and plastic parts, we can kind of combine both of these together. And that's what Joe Dean Morrow did to come up with the Morrow equation or the strain life equation for fatigue. Now, in order to do that, we need to have both of these in terms of strain. Uh, now, it's easy to convert stress in the elastic range into strain. You just have the factor of the modulus of elasticity. So the strain, the elastic strain amplitude would be delta sigma over 2 divided by E. So let's write that down. So we'll do that uh, on this page here. So let's just say combine these ideas so the total strain amplitude would be equal to the elastic strain amplitude plus the plastic strain amplitude I'll drop the T for the total but the delta epsilon over 2 then would be delta sigma over 2 divided by the modulus of elasticity E plus the plastic strain amplitude. And in terms of the 
fits in terms of reversals, then we have sigma f prime divided by e 2nf to the b plus epsilon f prime 2nf to the c. All right, so this is an equation that we'll use a lot in our class when we talk about the strain life approach to fatigue. We have the term here that's associated with the elastic strains. It's more the high cycle side, the stress controlled, the Baskin equation. Then we have the Coffin Manson term, epsilon f prime, the more ductility controlled term, epsilon f prime 2nf to the c. Again, both of these are cast in terms of reversals, and we've defined all these uh, different terms. When we put these things together, if you add two lines on log-log plots, you don't get a line because it's in, in log axes. What you get is a curve. So if we have one line that represents the plastic part, and the other line that fits really well for the elastic part, when you add these two together, what you get is a curvy line, and this is the Morrow equation or the strain life equation. Now there's an interesting point right here where these two intersect. That's called the transition life. And if you're on one side of this or the other, you're more strain controlled or you're more stress controlled. You're more high cycle or you're more low cycle. The point right here where these are the same values is when this term is exactly equal to this term over here. Now how do we find these coefficients and exponents? Well, we do tests in strain control. We count the number of cycles to failure. We turn those into reversals. We do a decomposition of the strain range, or the strain amplitude, into elastic and plastic strain amplitudes. And then we do a fitting uh, procedure in Excel or whatever. Now, as part of our project, I'm going to give you real strain-controlled fatigue test data. And you're going to find sigma f prime and b, epsilon f prime and c. Uh, the e, the modulus of elasticity, will be uh, what it is for steel. Okay, so you're going to calculate those different values, and we'll talk about how to do that, and, and I'll show you that um, uh, specifically with our data as part of the project. Now, let's talk about some things to be very, very careful with. The most important thing is cycles versus reversals. We've talked about this, but we really need to talk about it again. If you do a fatigue test and you record the number of cycles to failure, you have to go back and determine the number of reversals in order to find your coefficients. There are ASTM specifications on how to do this even. Use the reversals, not the cycles. Now, you don't usually count reversals in a fatigue test machine. You count the cycles to failure. So so keep that in mind. Be, be very careful and cautious and use the reversals. The other thing that's a little bit more subtle is that we're plotting this so that it kind of looks like our stress life curve, our S on the vertical axis and our N on the horizontal axis. Now we have the strain amplitude and the number of reversals to failure. If you were somebody doing um, uh, statistics, you know, you plot the independent variable on the horizontal axis, and you plot the dependent variable on the vertical axis. This is opposite to that. 
when you do that and you want to find some statistical information about your fatigue life and these values, your statistics analysis program is probably going to treat the horizontal axis as the independent variable. But ours is the dependent variable. So that can mess up some interpretations of, of some of your values as far as the, the variation of them goes from a statistical sense. You have to be super careful about how you interpret the values now that we're, we're plotting this in, you know, you can say the wrong way, in the customary way. Just be careful with statistics. Alright, and then the last thing I'll point out with this particular equation, we'll talk about some other information as well, but I also want to point out that it is not possible to solve for the number of reversals in a closed form manner. Uh, so what do you do? You can use the plot if you know the strain amplitude. Use a different color. If you know your strain amplitude, you can go over here and read the number of reversals to failure. But you can't analytic, analytically invert this, or algebraically invert this. So you have to use something like a, a root solver. For the number of reversals. I'm going to show you a technique that you can use. It's called the Newton-Raphson iteration technique. That will allow you uh, programmatically to find the number of reversals to failure. Once you find the number of reversals to failure, you have to divide that by 2 in order to get the number of cycles to failure. We've talked about Miner's Rule. Once you have the number of cycles, then to calculate the damage, you take the reciprocal of the cycles not the reciprocal of the reversals, take the reciprocal of the cycles to find the damage per cycle. And then uh, damage can be assumed to be linearly additive, calculate the total damage, then the total life of some sort of block cycle program like our pothole or our rough road type history. Lastly, whenever we have fits of data, it's really helpful to have an understanding of how good that data is. All right, so was there a lot of variation in the data? You know, was this data close to the curve or not very close to the curve? What's the scatter if you did a re repeated test? You know, what does this data look like? these fits are only as good as the data that's that goes into them. So when somebody gives you sigma f prime and b, epsilon f prime and c, and you just go plugging numbers in it and are, are quite happy to do so, because equations are easy, always have in the back of your mind that, uh, you know, do you know the person who took the data? Is that lab a reputable lab? Did they do a good job? Did they mess up with cycles and reversals? Did you mess up with cycles and reversals? Um, do you have enough data in the low cycle range? Low cycle fatigue data is really hard and uncomfortable to, to take, particularly fully reversed loading because the specimens can buckle and there can be other issues that happen. Um, so, so uh, you know, that's the importance of knowing your data. Let me put that over here. can't emphasize that enough. All right, there's one uh, last little bit I want to talk about that has to do with the general behavior of um, 
mean, mean stresses on strain controlled fatigue life. All right, so when we have our <coughs> specimen down in the lab, I'm just going to draw it as a cylinder. And we do our strain controlled loading. So here's epsilon versus time. And we do a constant amplitude, fully reversed, r is equal to minus 1 type loading on it. Um, the hysteresis response, if we have a stable material, we talked about transient effects, but for the most part, we end up with pretty much zero mean stress when we cycle this back and forth. And so we continue on. However, we've seen already that there are certain situations where we can induce overloads um, and have non-zero mean stresses. So we did this uh, as a previous example when we were looking at strain control, stress control, but now we can look at strain control. So let's see, if we go and we have a high tensile strain, we have some plasticity, and then we cycle it back and forth, let's sketch what the hysteresis response might look like. So now this is epsilon versus time. So now I'm controlling how far I go along the epsilon axis. <clears throat> so I would come down and strain and I would go back to the same value. Okay, so I'm controlling this distance and I am getting some stress value, some mean stress for that hysteresis loop. And if we had a different shaped waveform, then we could end up with a negative mean stress or a positive mean stress, or like we showed, even a zero mean stress. Well, the mean stresses tend to be more significant than the mean strains on fatigue life. And as we would expect, if we have compressive mean stresses, we would tend to have a longer fatigue life. So if we look at our basic log strain amplitude versus log number reversals, it's kind of curvy for the finite life region, this being our base um, zero mean stress case. If we have compressive mean stresses, we tend to have an enhanced fatigue life particularly at longer lives where the plastic strains are less. Okay, so if I were to take this at a certain strain amplitude, if I had um, zero mean stress, I would get this value of fatigue life. If I had a compressive mean stress, then I would get a higher value of fatigue life. Likewise, at tensile mean stress values, then the curve kind of looks like this. You would get shorter fatigue lives. And there are certain things to watch out for. So if you have really high um, cyclic strain levels, the mean stresses tend to relax a little bit. So the effect tends to be less pronounced on the low cycle side. On the high cycle side, things tend to separate out more and you see a bigger difference. So there are some different approaches that have been developed to account for these mean stress effects. One is known as the Morrow equation.
not to be confused with the stress life equation, the moral mean stress correction. If you're in a region where your elastic strain dominated, then we can calculate uh, we can account for the mean stress by modifying this intercept point. And so the strain life equation then is modified by having this term sigma f prime minus the mean stress for the cycle divided by the modulus of elasticity, number of reversals to the b, and then the plastic strain term is unaffected. How does this work? Well, it has a limited range of applicability and there are there are better ones. So we can label this as item one if we want. Number two is the Manson Halford approach. So they also incorporated the mean stress into the stress term. But they did some modifications to the plastic strain term as well. And how well does it work? Well, it has a limited range of applicability, and it, it does okay in certain regions, but it's there are better ones. The one that I want to spend the most time on is really the most popular one that, that is out there for a mean stress correcting strain life fatigue damage parameter is called Smith-Watson-Topper. three researchers and this has the um, idea that if we have constant amplitude loading we have a maximum stress that's equal to the strain amplitude that we saw with the Baskin equation can be fit with sigma f prime is equal to 2 nf to the b Now if we have a cycle that has a mean stress like this, well that cycle has a maximum stress and a minimum stress. And so we can adjust the strain life equation to also have an influence on what the maximum stress is for this particular cycle. Okay, and so we can start off with our basic strain life equation. Again, in terms of reversals, and multiply both sides of this equation by sigma maximum for a particular cycle. So we'd have sigma maximum, we have delta epsilon over 2. Now, instead of just writing sigma maximum, we're expressing this in terms of the Baskin equation. So we'd have a sigma f prime <coughs> times 2 and f to the b. So that's going to give us a sigma f prime squared over e. 2nf to the 2b power and on this term we'd have a sigma f prime and our epsilon f prime we'd have a 2nf to the b plus c power. <coughs> 
and as we saw in that sketch, sigma maximum for a cycle would be defined as the amplitude of the cycle, or the range over 2, plus the mean stress. So let's show that sketch again. This would be the stress range. Half of that would be the stress amplitude. This would be the value of the mean stress. So the maximum stress, which would be up here, would be equal to the mean plus the amplitude. So you calculate this number, and now you have a term over here that is a stress and a strain term. And then you go through and do your newton raston iteration or your root solver and find the number of reversals that way. Now if you have a case where the maximum stress is less than zero for a cycle, then you evaluate this as no damage. And there's different ways to look at this. A stress and a strain term is an energy type term. So if you want to think of this as being an energy relationship, uh, then you can think of that uh, in this fashion as well. But again, this is by far probably the most popular strain life damage parameter to use uh, Smith, Watson, Topper. So I'll just write down here, understand how to use the smith watson topper equation. You're going to have some homework that, that uh, where you will look at all these different three mean stress uh, equations on the, on the data. Mean stress effects on the, uh, on the results of your fatigue calculations. And you're going to compare that to some test data that was uh, taken and available in our book. All right, so... That's a short lecture on the strain life approach to fatigue. We're going to be digging into the details of using these equations and getting comfortable with these equations. The thing to keep in mind is these are uh, empirical fits. They take into account mechanisms of what goes on in the material only through the test data. They're not specifically tied to dislocation motions, movement, grain boundaries, and so forth. Kind of the current state of the art in fatigue is to try to look at those kind of quantifiable features of a material, try to relate them to fatigue damage parameters. That said, that's not an easy job to do. And from the perspective of an engineer trying to design a component, that's not necessarily um, the most time efficient use to, to be able to calculate fatigue life. So these are very popular methods, kind of continuum methods of dealing with things that aren't continua anymore when they develop cracks and, and things like that.